are listening to Appalachian Words, the show about language in Appalachia and the Great Smoky Mountains. I'm your host, Jennifer Heinmiller. I am co-author of the Dictionary of Southern Appalachian English, a historical dictionary that is over 1.3 million words long, covers all sorts of words from Appalachia, from a back of to zigzag fence to my personal favorite, circumvengimus. If you're curious about any of those or any other words that you associate with Appalachia, check out the dictionary. Appalachian English is a rich language with a history stretching back hundreds of years. But outside of the region, there are more stereotypes than honest conversation about the culture. So in an effort to bring this language and its history to a wider audience, I decided to start this show. For each episode, if you're a longtime listener, you'll know... I read and discuss entries in the dictionary and highlight certain points of Appalachian culture and history, uh, as well as talking a little bit about how the dictionary is set up and the process that went into compiling it. I welcome your questions, comments, stories, or any other message you'd like to send to me. Um, And you can find that contact information in the show notes, uh, or if you're just listening, not able to check the notes, the email address where you can find me is appalachian.dictionary at gmail.com. Welcome back to the mountains and foothills of Appalachia. This is episode 10. So today I thought I would talk about something a little bit different. Um, a place that is kind of lost to the sands of time, as they say, um, but still quite relevant uh, to the situation today, especially in light of recent events that we've seen um, with the Black Lives Matter movement really gaining steam, and we've seen uh, demonstrations all over the country, all over the world, actually, Um, If you've been following the news, you might have noticed the stories where we're seeing these protests and demonstrations, even uh, in New Zealand, which is about as far away from the United States as I think you can get on this planet. Um, So it's really a remarkable time of social change. Um, And I have had my eye on a community that is in, that was in Cumberland County, Kentucky, um, that just seemed to be ahead of its time in so many ways. Um, and sadly, as I said, it's been, you know, lost over the years. The settlement is no longer there. Um, but at one time it was a very interesting, almost utopian seeming community. So it is called the Co Ridge Colony or Co Ridge Settlement. Um, And I thought I would talk a little bit about that today. And some of you may have heard about it or may have heard uh, folklore. I don't want to really say urban legends because I can't imagine that many people in urban settings uh, have talked about it. Uh, But you may be familiar with it. Um, So, as I mentioned, Coe Ridge was a settlement. um, And it was in Cumberland County, Kentucky, which is right on the Tennessee state line um, kind of like not really towards East Tennessee, a little bit towards East Tennessee, I suppose. So just, you know, down there, kind of no man's land for uh, lack of a better term. And, um, I've been all over that area and there are very few roads to get from here to there. Um, so it's, uh, very rural, very rural. Um, and Co Ridge, so we can learn a little bit about this place just from the name alone. If you're familiar with the dictionary, um, you can check the definition of ridge, which might be a little bit different from what you're thinking of as the traditional definition. So in our dictionary, we have a ridge as a hill or a promontory between two streams, which is a little bit different. Um, I'm an avid hiker, as you may know, I believe I've mentioned it before. Um, but when you're talking about ridges, especially on something like the Appalachian Trail, you're thinking of like a knife edge, very narrow path, typically, um, that can be a little bit dangerous depending, you know, where you are on the trail. And there are some knife ridge trails, uh, even going through the Great Smoky Mountains, where you're literally just on top of this very narrow ridge. Uh, but in this sense, it is a bit different. So it's just a raised area of land. And it's not as small as you would think. Um, So Coe Ridge, the settlement, um, actually covered uh, between three and four hundred acres. 
So quite a bit larger than what you might imagine. Um, and we have all sorts of words in the dictionary related to ridges. Um, for example, we have ridge runner, which can mean a few different things, actually. Um, another word for one of the meanings is a ridge rooter, which is a domestic hog that's allowed to range freely in the mountains until it has become partially or wholly wild. I kind of like that. I mean, of course, it's a literal definition, but just thinking like figuratively what that could mean. It's kind of, kind of interesting. Um, but then we also have other meanings for ridge runner, which can refer to a person from the southern mountains uh, or a rustic, which is not the most flattering term, uh, especially someone from Tennessee. Um, so, yeah, and I think these days we have a specific meaning with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. A ridge runner would be someone who uh, is either a volunteer or paid by the organization um, to go up and down the trail and check its condition, um, just see what's going on and help maintain the general condition of the trail. So back to Coe Ridge though. Um, so we're going to go back in time a little bit, back to the 1900s. So Coe Ridge was officially founded in 1866, but we do have differing stories about when it actually started as far as how far back people were actually settled there. So there is evidence that there was a colony or a small settlement there as early as the 1840s, although this could have just been more or less some people camping out. Um, and this was made up of escaped slaves and Native Americans, possibly. Um, it could have originally been remnants of a Cherokee village or an offshoot of a Cherokee village. Uh, or even other tribes. Uh, you had the Yuchi uh, in that general area and some others. Um, so there is evidence that there may have been some sort of a haven there that took in escaped slaves um, and sometimes uh, white women from neighboring communities who had quote-unquote lost their way. Um, that could mean a number of things, but, um, you know, I think we can pretty much assume that it means young women who have um, not protected their chastity, whether that was by their own choice or not, um, and so they were ostracized from their communities. But there were a handful of these women who ended up uh, in the Co Ridge colony, and I'll talk about them a little bit more later. Um, so what we do know is that these people um, at that time and after the official founding of the colony they were highly illiterate, and due to that, we have very few records, which is really a shame. So I've, uh, I've put together a little bit of research here. If you have more information on Coe Ridge, I would love to hear about it. Um, the records are scant, and right now, as you know, we're still in the middle of learning how to live with COVID-19, um, and my local library is still closed, um, so I can't get my hands on some of the, uh, the primary documents that might give me a better handle on the subject. But I thought I would talk about it anyway, um, because I find it interesting and thought I would share it with you. So, um, going back a little bit further, uh, leading up to this point. So, if you've been to East Tennessee, you know it's a pretty rural and wild place. And two, three hundred years ago... It was even more so, as you can guess. Um, but that doesn't mean that no one was there. As of the 1730s, we have evidence of at least 64 documented Cherokee villages and towns uh, which had pretty large populations. Um, there were other tribes, as I mentioned, with some settlements. Uh, these were smaller. The Cherokee dominated the area. Um, and at that time... And the years kind of following that, going into the 1800s, we did have uh, European descendant uh, white settlers come into the area. Now, slaveholders were not particularly common in Appalachia. It's always been kind of a, a bootstrap, do-it-yourself place that attracts more poor people, people forging out on their own, uh, rather than the people who would have a lot of old money coming from these prominent European descendant families uh, who would be involved with the slave trade, like we saw more so along the coast um, 
in the Carolinas and other places. But that's not to say slaveholders did not exist in Appalachia. Estimates are that about one in 10 um, white settlers in this area held uh, one or more slaves. Um, And these, when I say white settlers, we're talking about people who would come in from North Carolina, Virginia, and East Tennessee in particular. Uh, And by and large, these settlers were farmers. Now, another interesting thing, I mentioned the large Cherokee population, other uh, Native American tribes. There were some Native Americans who held slaves, and they actually um, participated in slave trading with white settlers and communities in the area. So I think that is a part of our history that not too many people are aware of, but it is important for this story. So, uh, moving up in history a little bit. Um, So, in, you know, 1860s, things are heating up in the Civil War. Um, And we have a handful of slaveholders around in, you know, around the Cumberland area. Um, And this area was a bit divided. If you're familiar with the history of East Tennessee, you probably know that a lot of East Tennesseans were pro-Union. And a lot of the young men there, they actually fought on the Union side instead of the Confederate side, which is what you might assume just, you know, looking at where the Mason-Dixon line falls. Um, And in this area, Cumberland County, things were very split. Um, So a lot of the farmers and, of course, the slaveholders Understandably, they were for the Confederate side. Um, Other communities were for the Union side. So you had some tensions in this area already. Um, Well, so in 1863, uh, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which officially freed the slaves, or should I say technically, freed all slaves um, throughout the United States Although in actual practice in the southern states, of course, it was not that quick. It was not that clear cut because they were still fighting pretty hard for a couple more years. Um, So at that point, you had, you know, different things going on depending on the area, depending on even, you know, the family, the the microeconomies of these um, locales. So at that point, after the Civil War actually ended... Uh, many of the former slaves were kind of at a loss as to what to do. So some of them became sharecroppers on the land where they had previously been slaves, which unfortunately in many cases was not a whole lot different from being a slave in actuality. Um, Just working very hard from sunup to sundown, uh, earning very little for the crops that they farmed, the work that they did. Um... So others, if they had the opportunity, they would relocate to northern cities where we were starting to see industrialization happen on a larger scale. So you're looking at places like um, Indianapolis was mentioned for some of the people in East Tennessee, um, Chicago, places like Dayton, Ohio, Cleveland, uh, anywhere around the Rust Belt. Um, So they were going to those places if they could, but many of them did not have connections there. So... It was, of course, much harder for them to travel all the way there and gain a foothold. So, um, looking at this situation, we have right here in this area um, a former slave named Ezekiel. So, he was already middle-aged at this point uh, when the Civil War ended. Uh, He is the one who officially founded Coe Ridge in 1866. So prior to that time, he was a slave who was owned by Jesse Coe. Um, and he actually, apparently, he liked Jesse Coe well enough that he um, took the Coe name. And I'll just go ahead and say right here that a lot of this research, what I discovered was that much of it seemed incredibly biased um, towards the white perspective um, and was more sympathetic than I, than I anticipated um, towards the slaveholders. And um, the documents I'm talking about were written anywhere from, say, the 1940s through the 1970s. Um, and I was a bit shocked, <laughs> to be honest, about some of the documents from the 70s and the language used to describe the situations um, with slavery um, and other topics uh, 
adjacent to that. So if you do go and check out any of these resources, just please be warned. Um, they're a product of their time. They're a product of those particular people. And I have just done my best to put some research together here um, the best way that I can and try to read between the lines. So I think we need to take the whole story with a grain of salt, especially when we hear about things like that, where uh, he supposedly liked his owner well enough to take his name. Was that really the case? Or was it more the case that, well, he had to have a last name and that was basically his only choice? I mean, I suppose he could have made something up, but would that have caused bad blood? Uh, we don't know. But whatever the story may be, he took the last name Co. Um, and apparently this uh, Jesse Co. he liked Ezekiel enough um, enough to sell him the back portion of his plantation, <laughs> the back portion of his plantation, which happened to be a bit over 300 acres, which just gives you some idea of how massive some of these tracts of land were. 300 acres was just the little back part. I mean, oh my goodness. Um, thinking about the labor that must have gone into uh, maintaining this entire plantation. It's just mind-boggling, uh, especially without all the mod cons that we have now, not even cars and uh, not even roads, really. Um, so, anyway, back to Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was an interesting uh, guy as far as his background went. Um, they say that he was actually 50% white. Um, also, only... 25% black and 25% Native American. So he's not really your standard picture of what you think of uh, when you think of, you know, slavery. If you've seen Roots or anything like that, he was a bit different. Um, and just given the background that I mentioned earlier, how there was a lot of interaction between Native American tribes and white settlers and the slave trade, it's easy to understand uh, why in this area it might have been different from areas closer to the coast. Um, so Ezekiel, uh, gains this 300 acres of land. Well, he and his wife did. He had a wife named Patsy. Um, so they became the founders of the Co Ridge colony. Um, so at that time when they took possession of the land, it was completely wild and overgrown. So maybe that's why Jesse Co decided to sell it. You know, he realizes, well, I no longer have slaves to do all the work for me. And what the heck am I going to do with 300 acres of wild mountainous backcountry? Well, I guess it's not terribly mountainous in those parts. It's more plateau, but you know what I mean. If you've ever been uh, out there just in the country, anywhere, uh, land that has not been touched uh, by modern equipment or modern farming or uh, development of any kind. It is tough. Uh, you can barely walk through in many places. So uh, Ezekiel and Patsy, just uh, having the ambition that they did, they thought, why not? Let's do it. So uh, what they did discover, or what they probably already knew, just given the area, that land was rich with American chestnut trees. Uh, if you're not familiar, American chestnut trees were these enormous trees. Um, you can actually go online. I believe it's American Chestnut Foundation. You can see pictures of these trees. They are nearly as big as the redwoods in California. Um, I saw a picture of a family posing in front of one of these trees, probably very early 1900s. I guess it had to have been. Um, all five members of the family were standing in front of this tree and the edges of the trunk was still beyond the uh, the members of the family who were like on the edges. Like it's just huge, absolutely massive trees. Um, now a blight came through, it was a type of fungus, came through in the early 1900s and it spread slowly over a number of years and actually caused the American chestnut to go completely extinct. Uh, which is why if you're out hiking in the mountains now, you don't see these enormous trees like you once would have. The landscape is radically different now from what it was um, due to that. Um, it's it's kind of wild to imagine uh, trees that big. And they were, they were very prominent too. Uh, I read somewhere 
that up to one in four trees uh, in the forests of the Appalachian Mountains were American chestnuts. So they were absolutely everywhere. And given their huge size, they were able to produce tons and tons of chestnuts, quite literally tons, um, which were used both for food uh, and as items to sell. So a way of making an income. So needless to say, they were delighted with this discovery. Um, It was also quite close to the Cumberland River. It was situated um, just east of the Cumberland River, which was a great means of transport. Um, So in those days, they did not have roads. And that river was really the only means of transport. Um, And it was actually used by steamboats and flatboats well into the 1900s, up into the 1920s, 1930s, um, before the highways were built. Um, So technically, Co Ridge is the western spur of Pea Ridge. So that's another hill Uh, obviously situated slightly to the east of Coe Ridge, which adjoins with Clay County, Tennessee. Like I said, it's right there on the state line. So, um, as I said, the river is incredibly important, and it's kind of like a river bend there. So the bend kind of goes out and around the western side of of Coe Ridge, (laughs) and then up kind of the northern edge of, uh, of Pea Ridge. So it was really, really good for logging and, uh, and other things that they needed to transport. Um, and that was until, well, really until 1961 was when the first really convenient road was built there. Uh, before that, there were other minor roads that were built um, the couple of decades leading up to that. But 1961 is when Kentucky State Route 61 was built through Pea Ridge, Um, which connects with the nearby Kentucky State Route 100. But there still was no road that went directly through Pea Ridge. Um, 61 just kind of went, you know, out and around it. So it was still tough, even into the 60s, to really get at these places. And like I said, you know, if you've ever been in and around there, there's, there's so many of these little places where it's like, you just can't get there from here. Um, so anyway... Um, those two highways were built mainly to connect the bigger towns of Burksville and Tompkinsville, uh, which missed several of the river communities right there. So, um, getting back to the Coes, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Jesse Coe and how he came to be there. So, his father was named John Coe, and he was born in 1784. He was the son of a settler called Isaiah Coe, Uh, of North Carolina. So John lived in North Carolina and decided to move to Tennessee in the early 1800s. And then from there, he decided to try his luck and go up into the Cumberland area of Kentucky. And he was uh, pretty well known, actually had a lot of power. Uh, He became Cumberland County's high sheriff and magistrate. Um, So pretty prominent family, uh, all things considered. Uh, What we know about his family is that he had probably seven kids, um, and when he died, he decided to uh, write a will, and he left his land and his slaves because he held a number of slaves. Um, So he willed all of this quote-unquote property, and I, I use that term wincing the entire time. He split all of that up between his children, which I don't have to tell you how horrible that is, but sign of the times, right? That's how things were. Um, So when John moved originally from North Carolina, he brought with him three slaves. uh, And one of those was Ezekiel, who was his favorite. um, And he also brought Ezekiel's brother and mother. So those were the three who accompanied him from North Carolina to Tennessee, um, after which point he acquired more slaves Um, But at that time, it was the three of them, and Ezekiel was always the one that I guess he was closest to or that he relied upon the most. Um, So it made sense. So, you know, uh, Jesse would have grown up uh, with Ezekiel around, so he was fond of him too. And again, we don't really know what kind of relationship it was, uh, if the feelings were mutual or in what way 
Um, he was fond of him. Was he fond of him because he was a good hard worker, because he was obedient, or because he was kind, because he was a fatherly figure? We just really don't have any way of knowing. Um, and it's it's difficult to try to read anything further into that without knowing more. And it's unfortunately pretty impossible to do so since we don't have any letters. Um, I don't believe Ezekiel could read or write. So, lost to time. But anyway... So John had purchased those three. So Ezekiel's brother, mother, and Ezekiel, he purchased all three of them from a Cherokee slaveholder in North Carolina. Um, And the slaveholder who sold them to John, uh, he was actually the father of Ezekiel and Ezekiel's brother. So you had some of the same uh, the same incidents going on with the Native American slaveholders as you did with the white slaveholders. Um, and that's all I'm going to say about that. So in 1840, um, Ezekiel married Patsy Ann, uh, and they had a broomstick marriage. So John Coe, I guess, conducted the wedding, and he uh, actually held the broom for them, and they jumped backwards. So, if you are familiar with a broomstick wedding uh, or the tradition of jumping the broom. So, actually, let's just go to the dictionary for a second here. We do have a definition here. Broomstick marriage, also called broomstick shindig, uh, which is defined from some of our sources as a common law marriage sanctioned by the community, but not having the benefit of a marriage bond or license obtained from the county. So... A wedding, I guess, in fact, but not uh, legally speaking. Although when you're looking at these very rural areas, I do kind of wonder how many marriages were actually legal legal with, you know, some kind of a marriage license and records uh, outside of just recording in the family Bible and that kind of thing. Um, Whether, you know, the husband and wife were um, black or whether they were white or whatever. Um... So I was researching this tradition of the broomstick marriage, especially when I read that they jumped the broom backwards. Um, And what I found was that in many areas of Georgia in particular, they would jump over the broom backwards. And when I've seen it in depictions in TV uh, or even recently, it's kind of a a trend that has resurfaced. Anyway, usually what I see is people jumping over it forward, you know, holding hands and jumping together. Um, But some of the research that I found was that uh, first the man would jump over it and then the woman would jump over it because, well, you know, in those days they did not recognize uh, gay marriage. So, you know, I'm just going to say man and woman, no judgment here. That's just how it was. I'm not falling on one side or the other. Gosh, this is a really charged episode, so please bear with me as I try to tread lightly. I am extremely liberal, um, and I'm just trying to present the data here. So anyway, back to the broomstick marriage. So um, the point is, my point is that originally it seems that one spouse would jump and then the other one would jump. Um, But then you see where they would jump over it um, holding hands and going at the same time. So... The origins of this tradition are kind of murky. And for a long time, or a lot of us in America, I think we were kind of brought up on the stories that this was an African tradition that slaves brought with them. Um, But there's much more evidence, especially recently, that that is not true. And it actually originated on the plantations um, as far as from the black perspective or the slaves' perspective Um, We do see that there was a very similar tradition in um, certain cultures in Europe. Um, I read about certain communities where, um, and again, I'm going to tread lightly here because I saw that certain communities that call themselves gypsy, although I don't know if that's the politically correct term. I'm not European. I've never lived in Europe. I'm not really familiar with that. So please forgive me if that's not the politically correct term. Um, But some of the communities, um, they would have uh, something very similar to that. Um, So it's possible that that could have come over with some of the white settlers. 
There's another theory that uh, white slave owners kind of forced this on the slaves as just kind of a demeaning thing to do, just one more way to show their control, exert their power over the slaves, uh, which is equally, if not more believable to me, I believe. Um, or was this something that the slave community could do because they had so few resources, they wanted to celebrate and mark the occasion in some way? Um, it's, it's just really hard to say. Um, but it is interesting. It's very interesting um, that there are so many differing stories. And I even read several accounts of former slaves who had been interviewed uh, years after the fact into the 1900s saying that they never even saw a broomstick marriage and it was all fiction. People just got married, quote, the normal way. Um, and everything you hear about broomstick marriages was a lie, um, which is very interesting because we do have documented uh, incidents of this, um, but maybe it depended on the region, maybe it depended on the plantation or community. So that's another mystery, um, somewhat lost to time, but uh, interesting nonetheless. So anyway, they had their, their broomstick marriage, according to the story. Um, and the two of them ended up having at least 12 children. So 12 children in these backwoods starting out on a plantation. Um, so at this point, um, so they're, you know, living their adult lives on the plantation. And uh, John Coe and then later Jesse Coe, they worked out a deal with Ezekiel, as uh, some slave owners did, slaveholders maybe we should say, um, where Ezekiel and other slaves were allowed to farm some of their own crops and do some of their own labor to make their own money um, outside of, you know, I hate to say earning their keep because my gosh, they earned a lot more than just the keep that these, uh, these slave owners um, gave them. But the point is they were allowed to make some of their own money, which is exactly what Ezekiel did. So he grew some of his own food. Um, he did things like make baskets. He made chairs. He was a very skilled craftsman, uh, very self-reliant. Um, so he was able to actually save up a little bit of money this way, uh, which is pretty remarkable to me that he would have had that much, um, that much time and energy to keep doing that. So that is how he was able to, able to save up enough money to eventually buy those 300 acres from Jesse once the Civil War ended and he was able to do so. So, um, among their children, let's see, they had uh, a daughter named Mary. Uh, and I found an interesting linguistic note here. Her name was Mary, but they most often pronounced it Murray. Um, and I have read other accounts where the Coe Ridge Colony seemed to have their own little micro dialect. Uh, but unfortunately, there's not a whole lot that we can uh, learn about that just since the records, they just don't exist. There are a couple of interviews. Um, and there's a book based on oral interviews uh, with some of the people who lived in the colony that was published in the 1970s. Um, but in those cases, you know, it was kind of written out like I dialect. Like if you've ever read, say, Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer, the way that it's written out, kind of phonetically spelled, kind of trying to approximate uh, the way that it would have sounded. Um, but some of those things, we don't really know how accurate it was. There's some ambiguity in how it's written out. So unfortunately it's not that reliable, but it did, it did strike me that Mary would be pronounced Murray. So anyway, just a little side note there for us linguistic nerds. Um, in addition to that, they had another son named Riley, and this is one of the most famous, um, stories about their family. So you have to understand, even though this was a very rural backwoods area, the KKK was very active. They had a lot of control in the area. Um, so that threat was always there. Um, you had a lot of um, slaves who had run away from their plantations, um, just trying to get away, get to a better life, be reunited with their family. If the family was split up, which unfortunately happened in many, many cases, um, so in Ezekiel and Patsy's case, that absolutely happened. Um, and one of the books I read was very sympathetic to Jesse saying, 
well, he tried to keep all the families together. He really cared about them, but he's still selling them off. So I don't see how... Anyway, (laughs) modern point of view. I digress. I digress. So their son, Riley, he was a teenager when um, Jesse Coe, so John had already passed away. Jesse was in charge now. Jesse decided to sell him um, and this boy, Riley, he was, I guess, a spirited young man, um, very strong, but also strong-willed. Um, so Jesse sold him to someone else. I think, I forget where he was sold, either into, uh, Tennessee or Georgia, um, not too far away. But Riley just decided that he was not going to have this at all, uh, and he decided to run away from the new slaveholder, Um, And he made his way all the way back to the Coe Plantation. And this was in the 1840s or no, this, I'm sorry, this was in the 1850s or early 60s. So he ran all the way back, uh, made it all the way up there. We don't know if he had help finding the way maybe from uh, Native Americans or other refugees, uh, but he made it there. And his parents, of course, were pretty surprised, but they took him right in. And despite this uh, reputed great relationship with Jesse, of course they didn't tell him. No way. But what they did do was they hid him under the floor of their cabin. And when we say cabin, I mean, this is a one room, very basic accommodation, very small, incredibly small. So they basically just stuck him in this tiny hole and Riley, he, you know, kind of got down in there, shimmied down in there. With these simple tools, he just kept digging and digging and digging and making himself this, like, underground bunker, for lack of a better word, his own private hideout under the floorboards. And he actually lived there for 18 months. 18 months in a hole under the floor of this very primitive tiny cabin. Just let that sink in. Eight months. And here we are, like all complaining about, you know, a few months of lockdown with the uh, COVID-19 situation and our TV and internet and grocery delivery and 18 months in a hole in the dirt, in mud that leaks, you know, it rains. Where does the water go? Um, right in the hole for 18 months. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, During this time, of course, his, you know, the uh, former owner that he ran away from was really ticked off and they were looking for him, um, you know, KKK, some of these other, you know, vigilante groups were involved, looking for him just up and down all the ridges, um, putting out notices and they kept coming to Jesse and saying, okay, well, where is he? Where is he? Accusing Jesse of harboring him, accusing uh, Jesse of allowing his slaves to harbor Riley. Um, so Jesse's like, you know, I think he has a hunch, you know, maybe he suspects that Ezekiel and Patsy know. Um, so he keeps asking them and they're like, nope, nope, no idea. No idea. Meanwhile, (laughs) Riley's under the floorboards, just digging away, you know, making a bigger space for himself. Um, so Jesse, I, it's hard to say how much he knew, but he made a deal with this uh, other slave owner that uh, he would, buy Riley back personally for $500, which is, you know, no small amount of money. Um, quote, if he ever comes back. So, hmm. Uh, and apparently this was Ezekiel's idea. Ezekiel said, well, you know, you keep asking me and I just, I don't know, but you know, maybe, maybe if you promised to buy him back, uh, maybe he would just show up like, hmm, (laughs) that's not suspicious at all, Ezekiel. Um, But anyway, so Jesse took this plan and uh, proposed it to the other slave owner. And the guy said, all right, that's fine, but you pay me up front. Give me the money now and we'll see if he shows up. So Jesse's like, all right, fine. Gives him the 500 bucks, goes home and oh my gosh, wouldn't you know it? What a coincidence. Here's Riley hanging out on the front porch or something like that. So anyway, um... Very interesting. I'm not sure if anybody got punished, um, but Riley was officially reunited with his family and did not have to stay in the hole anymore, so far as I know. 
Um, now, some of their other, uh, they being Ezekiel and Patsy, some of their other children were sold or, quote, loaned out to other slaveholders in the area. Um, and they were still away uh, when the Civil War ended, um, after the Emancipation Proclamation, of course. So after that, um, Ezekiel and Patsy had the goal of reuniting their entire family again, seeing their children again, uh, which they were able to do. It's remarkable. I, I would bet money that a lot of those families were not able to be reunited, but this one, uh, thankfully, they were able to do it. So uh, following the Civil War and with uh, Riley <laughs> hanging out and some of the other kids, um, they relocated from the main part of the plantation to this back 300 acres. And the first few years was really all about just scraping out an existence. So they needed to clear the land. They needed to start getting some crops going. They needed to build shelter. So they were chopping timber, uh, building these very simple cabins, um, just really, you know, getting up a place to stay, uh, before the winter came, um, to sustain them while they put all their crops in, um, and tried to start making some money on their own, kind of getting used to a new mode of life, but it wasn't that different really from what they had been doing. But now they were able to do it on their terms. It's just amazing. Um, so at that time it started, it was their idea really. And of course, since Ezekiel was the one who purchased the land, um, it was called Co Ridge after his adopted, um, name, his adopted last name, but some other former slaves came with them. Um, and we also don't know, you know, kind of like the Riley story. We just don't really know if there were already people hiding out there, um, or just who had set up shop there. There is some evidence that they were there. Um, and if anybody would have known about it, I would bet that Ezekiel knew. So it's possible that there were people and they helped set up this little, uh, settlement or colony. Uh, whatever you would like to call it. Um, so, um, they have their little settlement going. It's almost a little town. Um, it starts to do pretty well. You know, they're kind of scraping together a living. They're doing all right. Their crops are doing all right. Um, one of the things they discovered they could do because so many of them were hard workers, they knew the land, they knew the trees. They started logging themselves and rafting. So they would you know, chop down these trees, uh, cut up the logs and raft them together and they would float them down the Cumberland River um, and they would sell them at markets in Burkesville and other communities. So they were able to really um, make a decent living that way. So another benefit of the logging was they had to clear that land anyway. So it was really just kind of a bonus. I mean, a bonus when you're putting in tons and tons of hard work and manual labor, but all the same, you know, you make money that way and you get your land ready for farming. So it was kind of a, a win-win situation as long as you were willing to put in the sweat equity, I suppose. So um, into the 1880s, so we're looking at uh, 15, 20 years into the existence of this settlement. Logging is still the main activity of the colony. Um, although, you know, all along the way, um, like many, many communities in the area, uh, a lot of them would also kind of, you know, make their own moonshine, um, they took to bootlegging a little bit here and there as both, you know, a means of making a little bit of extra money on the side, also because they liked it themselves. Um, so yeah. And by the way, bootlegging, you've probably heard this term. It can refer, well, it, as a verb, of course, it refers to either making, um, alcohol illegally, really, because you're not registering it with the government, you know, it's not subject to tax or anything like that. You're doing it hidden uh, in a way that's not really subject to any quality control, certainly. Um, although even commercial alcohol at that time, you kind of wonder what kind of quality control was going into it. Anyway, I digress again. Um, but you also have bootleg as a verb, meaning to sell it. So selling it illegally. Um, and then bootleg can also be used as a noun to mean um, the alcohol itself. So it's a very multi-purpose word, and they certainly used the product for multiple purposes, can we say. Um, so as this, uh, this settlement went on, 
So they started developing their own culture. Remember, they were incredibly isolated. I'm sure they still had a little bit of contact with Jesse and his family um, because they're sort of living in their backyard, you know, if your backyard is like a couple miles away. Um, And they had some contact with these other uh, communities when they did their trading. But they were by and large very isolated and they didn't often have outsiders come in, at least in the beginning. So they had their little, basically a haven there. Um, And as the years went on, uh, more and more Cherokee would come in. I, I don't know if there were members of the settlement who had belonged to other tribes. The only thing that I found was Cherokee, but it is possible that members of other tribes came in. Um, and then you had little by little some, again, wayward white women from neighboring communities who would come in. Um, so you really had this very unique combination of people who lived together in harmony and they worked together. Uh, it was really kind of a, it sounds utopian. Of course, you know, we can't know how it was in reality. And as the years went on, they did gain a reputation for being a really rough place, uh, for being aggressive and for being drunks. Uh, But I think we can suss out the reason for that. So from the very beginning, you know, um, that area, even though it's pretty isolated, you do have communities that are nearby. And of course, you know, people here through the grapevine, even in the mountains, um, what's going on on the next ridge over. And of course, all around them were white communities. I mean, by and large, 99% white. And for the most part, they got along well with people of the Co Ridge community, you know, trading and things like that. It was a mutually beneficial arrangement. But to go back to what I was talking about earlier, about how when the Civil War came, the area was divided, and you also have active KKK members in the area, there was some hostility. Probably comes as no big shock to you. There was definitely some hostility uh, from the whites towards the Co Ridge uh, people. So this resentment would kind of bubble over sometimes. Uh, in the 1870s, 1880s, um, and towards the end of the 1880s, there were a couple of occasions where things really got out of control. And by all accounts, all accounts that I can find, both from the white communities around Co Ridge um, and also the Co Ridge uh, oral history accounts, They say that this was started by some of the white men who were in these communities who had long resented them. So in 1888, apparently some of the whites got very drunk and they rode on their horses right through uh, the Co Ridge colony, you know, right through the town, uh, the houses, um, and just did a lot of damage. They went on a spree uh, is the wording that I find. So they just, they, they busted the place up. Um, possibly injured people, tried to scare everyone, of course. Um, Which, of course, you know, you'd be a little bit angry, right? Anybody would. Doesn't matter your ethnicity, my gosh. Um, So after that, you know, tensions started rising. The same group of white guys come back and they decide to start stealing chestnuts, uh, which was one of the moneymakers for the colony, not to mention these trees were their property. Um, The colony owned... That 300 acres, all the trees, all the food that grew on it. So this was uh, outright theft. Um, And then things got a little bit nastier. Some of these guys, uh, drunk or not, would do things like uh, expose themselves to the children um, of Coridge Colony. And uh, the tipping point was that some of them decided that that wasn't enough. You know, all of these horrible things they had done thus far, it was not enough Um, And prior to this, there had been a little bit of fighting, especially outside of the colony, you know, and tensions, maybe in Burksville or one of these other towns when they were doing business. Um, There there would be fistfights, things like that. But nothing compared to what happened in 1888 when some white men came to the colony um, and they uh, basically tortured some of the children, um, forcing their heads through, uh, narrow fence slats and really physically torturing them. I won't go into it any further, but, um, these poor children, uh, were, yeah, harmed a lot, um, physically. And I'm sure 
emotionally, <laughs> needless to say. So this was really the tipping point. This resulted in a ton of violence. Um, and one of the members of Co Ridge ended up killing one of the white men who committed the crime against the children. So that unfortunately started the beginning of the end, perhaps. So after this point, um, they really gained a reputation for being kind of a nasty, hostile place, famous for murder, famous for drunkenness and aggression. Um, and I am sad to report that that did become true. It wasn't just a rumor, um, in part because the economy got uh, worse and worse. So since they were, you know, kind of getting to be known for this, people were afraid to do business with them. People were, you know, very wary of going anywhere near, which really hurt them financially, which put them under a ton of strain. Um, and then you have in the early 1900s, that's when the American chestnut blight came through. Um, so then they lose one of their timber sources. They lose a food source. Um, and at that time, the trees one by one were gradually either all killed or um, they had to be chopped down. So if you look on forestpathology.org, the government actually um, issued a mandate that if any American chestnut tree on your property showed signs of the disease, it had to be chopped down and eliminated. So that was a huge loss for them in so many ways. Um, so then, you know, we're moving on into the 20th century. Um, so what are they turning to here? You know, if they're not able to do, you know, very straight laced business over the table, they got to go under the table. So the moonshining really ramps up. Um, they start doing more and more of it. Um, and things just go from bad to worse. Um, they start suffering from some infighting. Um, and then, you know, moving into later into the 20th century, um, you move into World War I, where things get tougher and tougher, um, followed immediately by the Great Depression, when not only Co Ridge, but the entire country just goes into this horrible economic slowdown, and things just get very tough for everyone. Um, and it's around that time when members of the Co Ridge colony, they get desperate and they start um, stealing from neighboring towns, um, like raiding stores, raiding houses. Um, of course, many arrests are made. And one of the um, most effective punishments that the sheriffs in these neighboring communities decided on was what they called probation, but was effectively exile. So they would throw these guys in jail for a little bit, and then they would say, okay, we'll let you out on the condition that you leave the state by a certain date and you never, ever, ever come back. So they were forced out of their homes. Um, and unfortunately, the colony just declined very quickly. Um, the Great Depression followed right, you know, right on its heels with World War II. Um, so by 1958, there was not a single person still living in the Co Ridge colony, um, unfortunately. So it was short-lived. Its glory days were way too short. Um, I think it had so much potential um, and just, you know, for these various reasons. Uh, it's it's not a happy tale and I'm sorry to leave, leave this story on such a, a sad note, but I wanted to share it because not a lot of people know about it. Um, and the Co Ridge Cemetery actually still stands. And I did read that three of the original buildings are still standing. Well, I don't know if they're original, original, but uh, three of the buildings where I think people live, I think they're cabins that are still standing. Um, I don't know if they're on private land or not, so I wouldn't go, you know, don't go poke around in there on private land. Just, that's not very nice. But the cemetery is still there, and I believe it has a National Historical Marker on it. Um, so if you're ever in the area and you're curious about it, I think it's a really important part of Appalachian history and culture, even though not a lot of people know about it, even people right in the immediate area. Um, and it it shows that we can live in harmony. You know, it can be done. These people, at least three different ethnicities, who knows how many different backgrounds. If you look at slaves, you know, 
where they came from, their different uh, cultures, their respective um, ethnicities, even, you know, within those communities, there's a lot that we can learn from this scenario, both seeing that they could live peacefully and there's so much hope there, but we can also learn the lesson of what happened at the end of the colony. I mean, so many of those incidents could have been avoided. Um, So it, it really... It gives me pause for thought. And I thought I would share that with all of you to allow you to do the same, um, to think about it, especially in light of recent events and the world we're living in now, which with the pandemic situation and uh, the economy kind of, you know, taking a nosedive due to that, um, it's it's something to think about with tensions rising uh, or, you know, just kind of simmering all along in our own respective communities, even in this time and place. Um, So I hope that gives you something to think about. I feel like I should be ending this on a happier note, uh, but but I think, um, you know, it's certainly not happy for them. And my heart goes out to the the people who suffered there. But, But looking at what Ezekiel and Patsy were able to accomplish, um, that's pretty remarkable. And I think it says a lot about the human spirit uh, and the Appalachian spirit because it doesn't matter the ethnicity. They were all Appalachians and they sure accomplished a lot. So on that note, I will sign off here and I wish you all a wonderful week ahead or a wonderful month. I will try to get an episode out a little bit quicker, but again, no promises. It's a one woman show and I... Record it in my spare bedroom, so I will do it as soon as possible. Again, if you have uh, any suggestions or comments, or if you are an expert on Co-Ridge and you want to share with me, I would love to hear your message. Um, So drop me a line if you like, appalachian.dictionary at gmail.com, and I will put more information in the show notes if you're interested in looking into this material further. Take care.